What makes the relationship the most charged is when you play on the pole that is more native to you, preference-wise, right? But within that pole, there's such a wide variety of how that expresses. And the same is true for the woman's side. Um, she might be more at home in the more feminine, if you want to call it that aspect, but all the other aspects of her are always there and present. And to deny them completely makes for a very cookie cutter kind of a moment in time, right? And it becomes very cliche. Um, so when you allow the whole thing to play and you actually start feeling where's the strongest, you know, erotically charged moment for which, of course, you have to be sensitized. Yeah. If you're, of course, breathing like a locomotive down towards your imaginary balls, right, then you, you're not actually sensitized to the moment. And if you're doing the big stripper moves and moaning and groaning, you're also not sensitive to the moment. And so they're bringing it a bit back into the the human sensitivity allows for an actually much richer place. And the other thing I want to say about that is that one of the other fundamentalist myths is that only women should have flavors while men don't. Because, and, and as we all know, that's not true because otherwise there wouldn't be such things as uh, women liking firefighters or cowboys or Chippendales even, right? Or, they're, they're, you know, cliche flavors, but there's many, many other flavors. So training in all areas and then being able to express from the place where you are gifted naturally is very beautiful. And then you learn an array of other flavors so you can create some variety both ways. Flavors are a little bit like coordinates in the sense that Michaela was mentioning a few flavors, that the amorous fireman. You know, was it? <laughs> the culinary carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> he makes the table and lays the table. Anyway, but um, whatever, you know. But uh, these sort of sexy cliches, you know. But uh, they're, they're kind of coordinates. They have a certain sort of amount of light and dark in them, and you, they're just sort of pinpoints in a way, you know. In real time, you maybe do embody them in a certain deliberate way, or, or are they just representations, really, that you can use for practicing purposes to sort of familiarize yourself with the areas that you may not be very comfortable with, or you're interested in, but you lack skill or confidence? There's two ways that you can go at it, right? You can look at what is natively something that you're interested in. And most people, they sit somewhere on the spectrum where they are the most... Uh, natively at home, right? And so you can strengthen that by just playing with that and seeing how much of that you can bring to the sexual occasion. And sexual doesn't need to be the actual sex, but the erotic play, so to speak. So you bring you in your fullest flavor. That's one way to go. The other way to go is to kind of look at what's a flavor that you're sorely lacking, Right? Because what typically happens in relationship is you get a lot of one flavor, which is the equivalent of having pizza every night. I mean, that's great for the first week, right? Or the first three days or so. It's like, yeah, pizza. Oh, more pizza. Oh, more pizza. Oh, pizza. Right? So that, that's what actually happens. Then you want some completely different flavor. But typically, you and your partner are just not, you know, you're just not sushi. So, you know, so, and you don't want to be sushi, <laughs> you know, so, so suddenly you crave, you start craving, this goes both ways, it manifests different in women than in men, but suddenly you start craving sushi. Now, men often support their sushi habits via porn, so to speak, right? Women support their sushi habits via shopping and other things. Um, so you can learn how to be sushi, so to speak, right? have a different flavor and practice that so that you can offer that ever so often. Your partner probably doesn't need it that often because they like your general flavor. But if it's just that available, it's very boring after a while. And so one of the things that you can consider is what is the flavor that's maybe, you know, you could find out what does your partner like 
and that's pretty easy to find out. And, and then you can start playing with that by, by practicing that in your body. And so one of the ways that you can practice it, you can find somebody on YouTube or in person or wherever, you know, who, who fully lives that kind of or, or represents that kind of a flavor and then really just feel with your body what that feels like. And uh, this is for men and women, the same practice. You can learn about different flavors by resonating with people who have that flavor so, in some way. And then getting, getting your body to practice that so it's not really horrific and clunky the first time you roll it out. <laughs> it's a fairly normal scenario when you're in a relationship that... Uh, you will come home to someone or you have a date with someone and you set that up a while ago, but you're really not feeling it, right? And you, and, but now here you are and you have to kind of make the best of the, of the situation, which is you live together and, you know, you want to have dinner with each other or whatever, or you're on a date. On a date, you can fix it easier because you have time away before you get together. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to take personal responsibility for your state, right? It's a, it, it's, an, it's a gift and an added benefit if you have a partner who can actually help you out when you're feeling really shit, right? And sometimes it's as easy as uh, opening, you know, uh, or handing a glass of wine or or pouring a bath, and sometimes it's touch, and sometimes it's, how was your day? And, you know, trying to not have your iris roll back in your head while the other person, you know, goes on and on and on about how bad it was. It could, it could take the form of all different kinds of things. But when somebody else does it for you, touch really helps popping you out of your head, of course. But for yourself, movement does it. So in an ideal world, if you drive home from work, right, um, then you could in your car already put on some music. Maybe the sequence has to be you call a girlfriend and complain or you are a shrink, whatever, you know. Then you put some music on and you already bring yourself somewhat into your body or do things that allow you to um, be not as locked up as you could be, right, in an ideal world. Or you come home, you go and have a bath, or you have a shower, or you cuddle the dog or the child or whatever, you know, anything that softens you so that the responsibility isn't only on your partner. But the, the, the golden rule is the more you move your body, the less thoughts are going to overwhelm you. Well, asking for formal feedback is always difficult because you're going to get your feelings hurt one way or the other, right? Or, or it will ensue in some kind of discussion that's not going to end that well, particularly be because there is no practice context around it. But what you can, of course, do is try a bit of whatever that is and see what happens, right? And that's pretty accurate feedback because you're sensitive. So you'll be able to tell if that's a positive spike or a negative spike or, or, if, or if it's just a flat line. And so when you find something that actually creates a bit of, it could be either sexually or heart or availability, right? All of that's possible. Then you can calibrate and go, oh, okay, that one. And then you'll do a little bit more of that. In longer workshops, we do these five-day super intense things. We actually train people how to say no. Heart open no, right? Uh, which is hard for most people. Most people can't say no without closing the heart. And so uh, practicing a heart open no goes a long way. But once again, sensitivity eliminates a lot of that. Because when you're actually sensitive and you're not just on your own trip doing your own thing, you can feel the slightest fluctuation in someone and you can work with them there. So that's in here. Out in the world, the, the way 
I suggest, and other people have very, very <coughs> different opinions, right? the way I suggest is don't get yourself into, into situations where consent is an issue, right? Meaning um, be clear so far up front that you are not in a situation where you're suddenly finding yourself somewhere where now you're having to have a consent conversation way far down the road when you're no longer capable or willing or something like that. Right? Now, that's not always possible, and that's why you have to have strong boundaries and you need to uh, be able to feel yourself enough that you can feel a no in the moment and not three days later. And, and that's really the important piece, right? And that brings us into a whole other conversation of tantra and trauma and all of those kind of things. But essentially, what you want to strengthen is your own feedback mechanism where, with your body. So, I don't know about you, but I remember days in, you know, not so, well, in, in my 20s or so, where something would happen and three days later, it would suddenly occur to me that that wasn't okay. <laughs> Right? And then, of course, three days later, well, what are you going to do about that? You go there, and then it's like, well, why didn't you say something? Well, I didn't know. Well, it, you can't be trusted if you can't feel anything. Right? And so the first step is being current with your own internal feedback mechanism. Second step is being able to actually say yes and no. And if you're not capable of doing either of those things, you need to be at least smart enough to not put yourself into situations where y you will be um, getting into hot water because you can't do one or the other. No. I've learned over the years that boredom is essentially the layer that's above whatever reveals itself underneath. And so I try not to resist the resistance or, or the boredom. It's mostly boredom. It's ever so often I don't feel like it. Um, but I also have uh, some strategies where I just uh, restrict it to very, very, very little. So when I, when I you know, bump up against something or it's very difficult because of travel or things like that, I set myself like a two-minute mm -hmm. limit or something like that uh, and just go, okay, well, as long as I do two minutes, I consider that having done something on that day. Yeah. And I reduce it down to the point where I can do it. And then I stick with that till my um, desire to do more comes back, which is usually pretty quickly. But I'll give myself an out, so to speak, but not a complete out. No. And that's, that's how I've handled it. I mean, there's certain things I have practiced consistently now for 34 years, like consistently, where every day, except when I'm really, really sick or, you know, some, or I'm on a plane and lose a day or something like that. But when it, is, when it is morning somewhere and I get up, there's a set of practices I always do. And that can be anywhere between two minutes and two, three, four hours, you know, depending on how much time and where I'm at and what I'm doing and all of that. So by now, the built-in discipline of having done it for so long, of course, speaks you know, in the background always. But the other thing is that um, uh, I just reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. Yeah. I have to do it now with writing, right? I have to finish this book by September 1st. And I'm actually leaving for Europe on August 20th. So really my book writing deadline is August 20. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it feels very, it's the same thing. It's a practice, right? And it feels very daunting, particularly now when we travel or so. So what I do is the same day. I reduce it down to something that feels doable even in the midst of traveling, which right now is half an hour. And I set a, an alarm, and I can do half an hour. And when I know it's only half an hour, I'm actually hyper productive. Because it doesn't feel so, you know, huge and, and uh, 
you know, insurmountable. So that's how I would handle all practice is uh, reduce, reduce, reduce till you can do it and then stick with that because little and often is better than every once in a while for a long stretch of time. I've always felt very strongly that you can't do certain things unless you practice them. There was a time where I ran a a drug rehab where I gave up drinking (laughs) because it felt a bit hypocritical to sit there after having had a piss up the night before and then counsel people who potentially would die if they had ever another drink. So that's one of the motivations is the service aspect of um, of the teaching and counseling. The other one is just simply devotion, right? Just the, uh, um, the, the, the service to something way greater than me. And the third one is, um, you know, self-care or self, whatever you want to call it. Self-care is not a good word. I would say self-respect in a certain way, meaning caring for myself through practice. You know? And... Uh, you know, the rest is just discipline at this point. The thing that you're not doing because you are held back, the holding back, making yourself small, making yourself agreeable is one aspect. But the other aspect is what you're afraid of, what's going to happen when you become that, Mm -hmm. right? And so the shadow is more in the what are you afraid of that's going to happen when you become that. And so... The shadow would be something like, can you wield the power? You know, can you wield the fierceness? Can you, do you have a, um, a domain over the fire, right? Is the fire going to burn you? Is it going to burn other people? Uh, so so the, 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 you might, the, the, the very definition of the shadow is you're not aware of it, right? Uh, but it's certainly the thing that holds you back from going there fully. I personally don't think one thing can be the heal all ever, right? In general, anybody who tells you their thing is the thing by the very nature of of how we are as human beings is lying, right? There's no one panacea, so to speak. That said, I think that everything that, every modality there exists can be used in the right way or the wrong way, right? Like there's, we were watching this yoga documentary last night. If you haven't seen this, uh, you might, I think, enjoy this very much. I don't know what it's called, but, but in the beginning, they, they interview all these huge yoga people on how long has yoga been around and what is yoga all about. And they all have this, these fantastic answers from the one woman who's going, oh, yoga's been around for about 40,000 years. And the other guy going, I really actually don't know much about where yoga is coming from, one of the biggest yoga schools in the U.S. And it's like, uh, um, you know, so yoga can be used um, in, in incredibly beneficial ways, and you can ruin your body doing yoga. Same as, well, Tai Chi, I've never seen anybody... <laughs> ruin their body doing Tai Chi, but <laughs> but you can be very effective in Tai Chi, right, and really work with the meridians and do all, you know, like amazing stuff or, you know, just go through the motions. So within each modality, I think there's great use and misuse. And so I think that anything that engages the body uh, makes the body move and isn't used to be destructive, like, you know, let's just assume we talk about yoga, tai chi, weight training, whatever, in its good form, it can only be good, right? And meaning anything that makes the body move, anything that uh, makes the, the, the psyche unravel its, you know, freezes and holds, anything that creates a uh, um, health benefits can only be good, and I think they're all compl- you know complementary if you use them properly. There's uh, just a, what's so good about nowadays is we have all this aspect uh, access to all these aspects of 
body wisdom and body modalities and exercise and strength and all of that that you can pick and choose based on your circumstances and based on what you want to achieve. And that's a real luxury because that didn't used to be. Right? I mean, aerobics used to be like the height of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> remember those days? <laughs> yeah. Or isometrics. I remember that. There was like some big craze on some isometric stuff. Yeah, and, and that was like considered amazing. And when you look at how much Eastern and Western modalities and ever more are created, it's quite good. And, and so you can choose. You know, different things require different skills, but certainly learning how to set proper boundaries, which is what ending is, is something you can acquire. And you can acquire that with the help of um, professionals who are specialized in allowing you to learn how to set proper boundaries. And that's, uh, or you can read some books. There's some great books out there on boundary setting if you don't want to go and see somebody. Excellent writing done on uh, feeling boundaries, asserting boundaries, and, and strategies to set proper boundaries and end things and start things fresh and all of that. So you'll learn some skills. And then, of course, you, once you have some skills, you could use nonlinear to envision the whole thing and move it through your body and work with your resistance and work with your not good enough and your fear and whatever else. But as you said so rightly, when skill development is considered, skill development needs to happen. You know, you know it's like nonlinear can teach you how to play the piano. You might, you might unearth a deep yearning for expressing yourself on the piano, but that doesn't give you piano playing skills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's, I mean, boundary setting is one of the most important things you can learn. But, you know, one thing to consider there with ending things, of course, is that when you end something, it feels essentially like you're killing it. And, of course... Killing it is something that's innately unpleasant for women particularly because you don't kill things because yeah. you're essentially built to nurture things and bring them into life and keep them alive. So it's not uncommon for women particularly to nurture friendships or tolerate friendships long beyond their expiration point because... Um, Biologically speaking, the only way that you could survive for many, 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 you know, millennia was being on good terms with other women. It's the only way you could survive because men came and went based on war and, you know, and, and hunting. Um, and the women relied on other women for food and support with the children and childbirth and healing and cooking and collaboration. So, you don't actually, you're not built for ending things or, or separating yourself from your tribe, so to speak, right? So just biologically speaking, you're not built for that. And then most people are not taught that, those skills because it's all about being polite and appropriate and, you know, not ruffle anybody's feathers and not get bullied and, you know, so... so um, Collaboration is valued very highly uh, with no real education given on ending things cleanly. And one of the things people have such, one of, the, one of the reasons people have such a hard time ending it is that it, they think it requires a closing of the heart. Because of course, once you end something, you, people feel like they have to close the heart. And that in itself is very painful. Right? And it makes you also a bit unfeeling and a bit brutal, and then you won't end it right because you can only end it by kind of, you know, uh, ending it roughly. And so the, the art of um, staying hard open while setting the boundary and saying, okay, we're done, is not easy. No. Some people just t have a tendency to, to be very nauseous. In general, what's considered, and it's certainly true for me, is that when your energy moves up the front of the body, you get nauseous. Because the, uh, the way energy typically moves is you breathe down the front of the body, 
right? You inhale, and then, as I was describing this morning, right, your lungs fill, and if you breathe deep enough into your lungs, the lower parts of your lungs open up, and it pushes the diaphragm down, and then that brings the belly out. You're not really breathing into your belly, of course, right? Even though people say, breathe deep into your belly, or breathe deep into your yoni, or whatever. Of course, you don't have lungs in your, you know, <laughs> genitals. Um, but, but symbolically, energetically, you can, of course, do that, right? But technically, what you're doing is you're breathing into the lowest part of your, your you know, your lungs have these little wings that come out. And so when you do that, it pushes your diaphragm down, and then the energy goes down all the way to the, to the perineum. When you take a really deep breath, you can actually feel your perineum, right? So that's because of the pressure downward. So that's the proper downward motion of a breath. And then without being too technical or yogic even, your breath then goes up the spine. You know, it just goes up and out, uh, energetically speaking, right? And you kind of exhale and then that's that. And then you bring it back down. So if for whatever reason, because, you know, you, you get very emotional or your breathing gets a bit funny or you're moving and, and you're thinking of stuff, the energy starts going up your front. That's when you get nauseous and the, the, the throwing up is literally an up and out, up and out motion. So one of the things you can experiment with when you get nauseous is to really bring your breath down and um, bring your attention on the lower part of your body. That tends to help. One of the very dangerous um, things is the tension or lack thereof in the pelvic floor. And interestingly enough, even though it's told over and over and over and over that you should do your kegels, kegels are actually quite bad for most people. <laughs> One of the things that happens in most people is they are so pulled up all the time, but right? they're super tense in their lower body because of stress and tension, uh, trauma, reactions to stuff. So most people, when they get scared, go... <gasps> And that is, an, is a clenching of your pelvic floor and the pulling up. And so most people are perpetually clenched and pulled up. So the weakness in their pelvic floor comes from an overuse of those muscles. And no amount of freaking kegels is really going to make any difference because your muscles are already fatigued. So, for instance, people who have a, uh, you know... Um, a weak pelvic floor, let's say from having had you know, a number of children or so, are often better off doing squats, which strengthens different layers of the pelvic floor, which then doesn't strengthen that particular layer that's been overused over and over and over. And, um, and, and it's been found now that with squats, you can actually manage a lot of those you know, bladder incontinence things that people thought kegels were fixing, but actually often making them worse. And so that said, being able to fully relax your pelvic floor and feel what's actually happening down there is an interesting thing to do also for pleasure, um, management of your energy, all kinds of reasons. So try what happens if you relax your pelvic floor all the way. I'm pretty damn sure nothing's going to fall out. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the hacks, so to speak, since that seems to be a very popular word these days, right? One of the shortcuts to feeling your heart, of course, is to feel and think and imagine somebody who you really love, mm -hmm. right? And that can be somebody who's dead or alive or even an animal, it doesn't make any difference. Or a thing, right? I mean, some people are very attached to their, I don't know motorcycles or something like that, you know. So um, I'll play around with it. I mean, maybe it's outside of yourself, but I venture to guess that there's some sensation somewhere in your body that's connected with you loving. Yeah. It doesn't have to be over the heart. People feel different things in different places, their throat, their right side of their body, their legs tingling or whatever, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean, you know... You have like this glowing thing here or something like that. It's just there's some feeling connected with loving. Even, I mean, if you look at, um, I don't know, two puppies playing, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so if you imagine two puppies playing, does that light up your body somewhere?
And then you find that. You find something that makes you go, oh, everybody with the puppies, right? Um, and, and then that's, your, that's the heart. And then from there you can unravel it to what are you dedicated to or what you, are you devoted to. Because most people have an overarching dedication to something that their life is actually about. And it's typically not money. Um, you know, when, when you really, really feel it, um, most people, even the most hardened businessmen, they, they're, they're something that they're devoted to. And so you find that thing you're devoted to, and that's the, what you orient. That's your North Pole, so to speak. Numbness is not a problem, as uh, Steve, who you haven't, you haven't met. Oh, no, you've met Steve in, in, in Melbourne. Yeah, but um, he always says uh, uh, insensitivity is a sensitizing momentum, meaning when you notice that you're numb, you're actually sensitive to your numbness, right? So it's not a problem to feel that you're numb because you're feeling something. You're feeling your numbness. And so that, that's a sensitizing momentum. From there, you can feel what's under the numbness and so on and so on. So being numb is not an issue. And when you are numb, particularly when we do nonlinear, you just move as numbness. But eventually, you'll come under that. You'll feel what's under there. Well, you don't have to. The, the sexual, there's no sex in the shadow side. It's just... T- it, Tendentially speaking, once you are, once the shadow has been lifted out of its obscurity, out of its unconscious part, the, the freeing of that energy can be used creatively or sexually. So it's not that the shadow archetype in itself is sexy. On the contrary, it's mostly not sexy. But of course, the reason why you don't um, access Gollum is because it's not sexy and it's not nice and it's not pretty and it's not appropriate. So all that energy that's um, diverted towards being nice and pretty and sexy and appropriate gets freed. And then that energy is available for sexual feelings or, or, or sexual power or creative power or life force. You don't... You don't have to necessarily see it all in the, in the realm of sex. It's just usually a natural expression and it also comes up sexually. But it's just a freeing of life force.